Hi, and welcome to Rabo TV, a series showcasing groundbreaking developments in the food and agri sector. Today, I'll be updating you on the latest market movements, and with winter crop planting underway, Cheryl will explore the current grain market. This week, we welcome Sam Elsom, co founder and CEO of Sea Forest a company that together with Fonterra, MJ Bale and local farmers is pioneering the use of seaweed-based stock feed additives to significantly reduce agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. Welcome, Sam. Thanks, guys, very much for having me. You've been trialling seaweed-based feed supplements in livestock for a number of years now. What are some of the key outcomes in regards to methane emissions and other benefits in general? The original discovery came from the collaboration between CSIRO and James Cook University up in Queensland, um, they discovered that seaweed worked in, in basically completely abating methane from production from livestock. Um, the bottleneck at the time was that there's no commercial supply of the seaweed. So sea forests since starting about three years ago um, had to retain, you know, the world's leading scientists in the seaweed as well as commissioning research at three of the leading universities. And so we had to go very quickly in developing methods for cultivation before we could commence trials. So, um, and so we spent a good portion of our, um, our three years uh, in developing cult cultivation techniques. And now uh, it's only been 12 months that we've been working with um, uh, a merino wool farmer uh, called Kingston uh, here in Tasmania and, uh, and a dairy farmer of Fonterra's. Um, and so those, those um, two different trials have been, have had great outcomes. You know, it's, it's, it's more or less um, marrying with the results of the CSIROs. Um, and what we're looking at more closely there is um, in terms of Fonterra, for example, we're looking at it from a food safety standpoint. So what, what's going to happen to you know, the milk and, and, the, and the taste and, 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 the, um, and the health of the animals? And so, uh, so far, we're, we're really comfortable with the results and we're continuing um, that work with Fonterra. Um, with the other trial, which is the Kingston Wool Farm, where the fleece has been forward purchased by MJ Bale, we're looking at the impact on staple length and, and wool production. What, what will happen to the fibre quality um, over 12 months? So um, Simon, the farmer there, shore his sheep um, uh, back in July of last year. And so then since then, they've, the animals have been feeding on asparagopsis daily. And uh, he's due to shear his sheep soon. So we'll have a, have a, a look um, and analyse the impacts of the seaweed on fibre quality, which is really quite exciting. Going forward, will this be a commercial product available to all farmers? We sure hope so. I mean, Sea Forest is working um, day and night on developing techniques for, for cultivation on land and also at sea. Um, we've come you know, quite a long way in terms of our progress um, and developed methods um, for, for both uh, methods of farming. We're hoping to have, uh, you know, be able to feed 100,000 head of cattle by at least by this time next year. Given this development has the potential to reduce methane emissions in livestock, has there been any government support to assist farmers? There, there's been a, a lot of support by, um, by the government and by DISA, the Department of Innovation, Science, Energy and um, and resources, and uh, you know, Sea Forest has received a million dollar grant from the government to help um, commercialise its work. Uh, so I believe there is a lot of support at the moment. It's not being subsidised, uh, but I would also say that um, it's it's not at commercial scale just yet. Although Sea Forest is working on it. Do you expect consumers to pay a premium for sustainably produced beef and dairy in a potential three-way win for farmers, consumers, and the climate? Yeah, so I think that there are many examples, you know, with regards to say free range eggs where, or, or, or chicken or, or grass fed beef, for example, where there is a price premium. But what's, what's so amazing about the way the seaweed works and basically the, the seaweed, as I mentioned earlier, has this unique chemistry and there's a disruption that takes place in the production of methane. And, and that disruption, in fact, converts that which would have been expelled by the animal as a gassy waste product into energy that the animal uses to grow. So you get this almost increase in feed efficiency or increase in productivity. So you're in fact delivering more profit to farmers as opposed to um, requiring necessarily a, a price premium. Um, so, so it's quite a, it, it's a real win-win as you, as you pointed out. Is this a further opportunity for Australia in terms of clean and green branding? Absolutely. I think, you know, Australia, Australian livestock producers already have a fantastic um, reputation internationally. And I think this just you know, really puts us at the forefront of but not only innovation, but also leading the way in terms of reducing our environmental footprint. Um, you know, 
what we're talking about here is a 98% abatement. You know, that's that's like wiping around 13% of our carbon emissions per year um, and significant from livestock. So I think 75% of the emissions created on farm are those produced by animals um, through methane. And so we're talking about a, a meaningful impact on emissions reduction. Thanks so much for your time today, Sam. A simple, natural solution in the climate challenge. No worries at all. Thanks, guys. Some incredible results and uh, what a great Australian sustainability story. It sure is. What's happening in the markets this week, Ben? Well, central bankers around the world seem to be changing their tune on the course of interest rates. Over the last six months or so, we've grown accustomed to the message of interest rates being lower for longer and no rate rises until 2024 at the earliest. But in recent days, there has been a growing chorus of dissenting views. Following the Reserve Bank of New Zealand's policy meeting last week, the Kiwi governor, Adrian Orr, said that he thinks that the RBNZ may be able to raise interest rates around mid to late 2022. Even more significantly, the RBNZ published forward guidance for interest rates, projecting a cash rate of 1.64% by March 2024. That would be six rate hikes by the time the RBA is saying that they expect to maybe do just one. To continue the theme, over in the UK last week, we also had a Bank of England official saying that the bank could raise interest rates as early as the first half of next year, if unemployment performs better than expected. And in the USA, we saw Federal Reserve official Robert Kaplan saying that he believes official interest rates could start rising before the end of 2022. Regular viewers of this program would remember me pointing out that the inflation pressures that have been building across the world economy. And this is the reason why some central bankers are now getting cold feet about ultra low interest rates. Another reason is that we are expecting a wave of spending as battered Northern Hemisphere economies come out of lockdown and recover from COVID-19. This is well underway in the USA, where 40% of the population is now fully vaccinated, and in the UK, where 35% of people are fully vaccinated. The Aussie dollar has been strengthening for much of the last 12 months as we outperformed global peers on containing COVID-19. But we are now moving into a new phase of the pandemic. While Europe and the United States have leapt ahead on vaccination rates, here in Australia, our vaccination program has been slower to get rolling and only 2% of the population is fully vaccinated so far. That poses some risks to our ongoing economic outperformance as we're currently seeing in Melbourne and could end up weighing on the value of the dollar over the next few months. December 2021 wheat swaps are dealing around 318 Aussie dollars per tonne the Aussie dollar is buying 77 and a half US cents, and that's finance. Thanks, Ben. Now we cross to Cheryl to hear how the global corn deficit is driving up Australian wheat and barley prices. Thanks, Claudine. Corn is not only the world's largest grain crop, but it is also the world's second most widely traded. In Australia, corn is just a minor crop, but the consequences of what happens in the world's corn markets are anything but minor for Australian grain farmers. This year, the significance of the global corn market is playing out favourably, with some critical market movements in recent months. Global corn prices have doubled over the past 12 months, and in April and May moved into trading ranges not seen for seven and a half years. Why is this? Well, this is because 2020-21 has been the fourth consecutive year of corn consumption exceeding corn production. And this has taken global corn stocks to their lowest level since 2015-16. The deficit for this year is due to some marked changes in imports and export availability from some of the world's largest corn market participants. In particular, in the past 12 months, we've seen a 240% year-on-year increase in China's imports of corn. We've seen diminishing stocks in the US, the world's largest corn producing nation. Brazil, the world's second largest exporter, has also had a severe drought, reducing its production and export availability. And there has also been reduced export availability from Europe and the Black Sea region. With stocks so low, nervousness in April and May about the state of the 21-22 US crop moved prices to seven and a half year highs. Prices have now eased somewhat following some rainfall in the US that has taken the edge off, though not completely removed, production concerns. But what's important about these global corn price dynamics is that wheat prices have been swept along too, to be up 20% year on year. And that's because corn that accounts for 70% of the grain used in feeding livestock globally has become so expensive that alternative feed grains are being sought out. 
and this is translating into increased demand and higher prices for wheat. And these higher prices for wheat are set to stay around 20% above the five-year average over the coming year due to the underlying tight corn stock situation I've just outlined and only limited forecast gains in wheat stocks. This is welcome news for grain farmers who have just planted or are planting this year's Australian wheat crop, especially when the current outlook for Australian wheat production is good. Our current estimate is for close to 29 million tonnes of wheat to be produced this coming year, which is 20% above the five-year average and comes on the back of last year's record 33.4 million tonne crop. Each time we see Australian wheat production this good, prices inevitably drop, as we saw in 2011-12 and 2016-17. This was due to both good local supply and good global supply. Last year, Australian wheat prices dropped from drought highs, but didn't bottom out because of the post-drought stock rebuilding. But it was also because we had higher underlying prices than we'd had in 2016-17. But what can we expect for the year ahead, with a second consecutive year of good production predicted? The 2022-23 season will see a global supply response to the high prices we're seeing. But between now and then, we're expecting Australian grain farmers to see good production and good prices. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, Claudine. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of Rabo TV, the last for season one. For more information on sea forest asparagopsis trials, jump over to our Rabobank website, where this week we're showcasing innovative dairy farmers, including Richard Gardner, who is currently trialling the additive on his Tasmanian dairy. We've really enjoyed this opportunity to share with you our rural market insights and present cutting edge innovators in the food and agri space.